their life history in these different systems. Um, other interesting things, uh, I talked about the holding area. Uh, they breach. They jump all the way out of the water, or, um, usually in the holding area. And uh, while they're hanging out for these eight months, they'll just jump all the way out of the water. These giant things. They get like six, eight, nine feet long. Huge, giant things. That makes, I mean, why would something do that? It obviously takes a lot of energy to jump out of the water like that. They just do it over and over and over. So it's, it's interesting. Not many uh, marine fish actually do that, especially anadromous fish. So it's really neat to see. And uh, we don't really know anything about their habitats. We're learning a lot about it. That's kind of the current project that's going on, which is really neat. But we're all just figuring out the habitats they're using, the habitats they're utilizing, and some of these life history traits, such as breaching and hanging out in the holding area. And then lastly, the, the reproductive cues. What is cueing these fish? Remember, they're out in the Gulf of Mexico, and they're hanging out, and then they just go up the river and spawn in the springtime. Well, what's triggering that, that, in, uh, that behavior when they go? They're like, okay, let's go up the river. What's triggering that? And we're starting to look at maybe, you know, in the springtime we get these big Arctic blasts of fronts that come down. And it rains really hard. Then it gets cold the next day. Well, the rivers just spike. They just go way up, real high water levels. So that may be some reproductive cue coming down. When they're out in the Gulf and they feel that big pulse come out of a river, that might be why they start going up the river. So it's a lot of neat things. It's, it's a really big project. It's hard to get your mind around sometimes because there's so many unknowns. But it, that, that's also what makes it so much fun. And it makes my job so much fun. There's a bunch of pictures here of juveniles and one big adult leaping out. I don't know how they got that picture at that perfect timing. But actually in Florida, in the Suwannee River, there's so many sturgeon in the river. and They're jumping so much, they're actually boat accidents. When someone's going on the river real fast, they'll jump out and come right, hurt people with broken bones and things. So uh, it's very interesting how they do that and, uh, and to think about why, why they would do that. Okay, so the last species I'm going to talk about today it's the Alabama shad. This is actually what I did my doctoral work on here in Mississippi. Uh, it's an anadromous fish. It's, um, uh, like I said, just like the sturgeon. They live out in the Gulf of Mexico, and they are ascending. They're going up rivers to spawn. As you can see, this is an adult here. They're, uh, they're a lot smaller than the sturgeon, which is interesting because they're doing these same migrations. Up river, it takes a lot of energy, and they don't have that capability to store like sturgeon do, these big bodies. So it's interesting that they can actually do that. They reproduce in the spring just like sturgeon. Um, and the, currently they're listed as uh, um, candidate species by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and species of special concern by uh, NIMFS and uh, many other states have them listed as endangered, such as our own. All right. Um, sadly to say, they've been extirpated from over half of their drainages. They're gone. They no longer exist. This here is the historical where they used to be. And this is the present distribution. So their, their range has uh, been severely constricted. And... Uh, the interesting thing that they're prey species. They have no real structural defenses. Um, so it's, it's very important to have these fish in the river. People ask me, like, why do you study a shad? You know, who cares? But these are, these are prey species for other very important species. And it's, uh, they're an ecosystem indicator, which means having these species within the river is a very good thing because it allows us to, to um, somehow quantify river health and diversity within these rivers. So it's very important to study these things. And then all the different food web interactions that these fish have because they spend the entire, the juveniles can spend the entire summer in the rivers before they go back out to the marine environment and they can impact other, you know, the, the certain insects in the, on the river and all sorts of different food web interactions. And then here is, um, this is actually the Alabama River. This is some data from a T and O'Neill's paper they did on Alabama shad. Uh, the Alabama River, there's some uh, dams went in right, uh, pretty much right there and this is the presence of Alabama shad. Once the dams went in, it does not take long to remove them from the system. So once you have a dam and, uh, or an impoundment of some sort, an Alabama shad cannot go up past that dam to get up to the spawning grounds. It's not hard to figure out how quickly it can happen. And here's the Pearl River here in our state of Mississippi. Once the sills went in right here, pretty much couldn't get above them and uh, removed from the system very, very quickly. And then no presence at all within the Pearl River or the Alabama River today. So the Alabama shad, they do have a strong presence in the Pascagoula River, which all my work was done on and, uh, of course, other rivers around the nation. Okay, just a little bit about the biology. They're an allocyne or a shad. They spawn at a very young age, and they're highly fecund. They have lots of eggs. So unlike the surgeon, like I talked about just a minute ago, this, this is very good news. Because they reproduce at a very young age, and they uh, reproduce in high numbers, if we can figure out how to conserve this species and maybe reintroduce it to the rivers that they used to be in once we can learn to fix those rivers, I think it could be a great success story for our state. 
and uh, increase the food productivity within the rivers where they've been removed. Having them back in those rivers may increase all the, all the fisheries in those rivers, uh, put uh, Mississippi dollars back on those rivers. And they can migrate over thousands of miles without eating. I mentioned that earlier. They're just not as big as the um, sturgeon, so it's really interesting that they can make these migrations uh, without that just a big body for energy storage. And just a little tiny bit of data. In my doctoral work, I found actually that as juvenile Alabama shad are growing in these rivers, and they're really small just after hatching, they're living on sandbars. Okay? Those big sandbars you see on the rivers and you drive over on the bridges. And then with increase in size a later in the summer, as they're growing, they kind of find them out in the middle of the river, kind of a pelagic channel zone. And then at the end of the summer, October, November, when they're pretty much almost adult size, they're getting ready to go uh, meet everybody out in the Gulf of Mexico as adults become that anadromous life cycle to go back to marine. They're on that bank habitat. That's the real sharp bank that you see across from the sandbar where all the trees are kind of falling in on the rivers. They like that habitat when they're increased in size. And I just put this slide in here because I wanted to convey and uh, to show how important these habitats are to have on these rivers. So if you do impact a river and change a river, and uh, maybe these, these uh, sandbars go away or they're channelized, if you don't have these habitats in the rivers, uh, extirpations, removals of Alabama shad could occur. I'm just trying to show how important uh, the habitat types are. Because they're shifting habitats, you can't just protect one type of habitat. You've got to protect all the habitats within these rivers. So overall conservation recommendations that I kind of have from all my work in the past that I've done, just overall kind of conservation recommendations I like to put in talks. Uh, natural flows are important for habitat sustainability and reproduction. So we have to have those natural cues of water coming down. We have to have that natural flow to allow those sandbars to build up each year and stay clean and all those things. And rivers must be managed on a drainage by drainage basis, not a regional approach. So we, we can't just protect all the rivers in just a certain number of uh, recommendations. Each river is different. Each river has different species in them. They need to be managed separately and unique. Uh, the riparian zones around these drainages, all the trees you see falling in, the, tree, the trees hanging over, that's very important for these rivers. You need to have them there. We need to protect the areas around the rivers as well. And altered flows, if you do have a dam on a river, an impoundment, maybe instead of just saying they got to be removed, and, of course, you know, a lot of other people aren't going to want them to be removed, and that's fine. Maybe we can work together, and maybe we can release water down these things or allow water to go over top of them at certain times of the year to allow for these natural flows to mimic natural flows if there is an impoundment. So these species can actually maybe ascend over a sill or an impoundment, get over it or around it, or just to have that natural cue. So when you're holding water back, maybe these fish don't know when to come up and spawn because when you, when you start releasing the water, maybe that allows them to know okay, it's time to come up these rivers and spawn. So, so mimicking natural flows is very crucial for migratory fish. fishes. Okay, and that's pretty much it. I just have some pictures here. These are all in the state of Mississippi. This is up on Black Creek. It's a gorgeous tree here. This is Black Creek again. This is down the coast. Just a gorgeous place we live in. We should feel very lucky. And this is pretty much, that didn't come out real good, but this is, uh, this is everyone I've done work with on these projects that I've headed up and, uh, or been a part of. And uh, it just takes a lot of people to do these things. These are very field-intensive uh, projects. And there's my wife here. I drag her out a lot, and uh, she works hard, too. And uh, by, uh, this is pretty much all the funding agencies, all these different projects that I've done. It just takes a lot of money to do these things. And these are all the funding agencies that we're always going after and trying to get funding for in these conservation biology projects. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Are there any questions? About mimicking natural flow. Uh -huh. Is that a current around here? Is that a current? Or is, no, uh, is it happening? Yeah, the Pascagoula River, uh, there is no impoundment. So uh, all, the, all the rain that falls enters the river, and it just creates a natural flow out, a natural cue. So whatever rain is falling and flowing down the river, that's completely natural, providing those cues. But is it being introduced anywhere? You were talking about mimicking. Oh. Yeah, um, I've proposed a couple times at, at certain meetings, and I've, I've seen a lot of interest in it because it doesn't cost someone a lot of money to do that. You just release water from the dam. You just have to get authorization to do so. And I'm not asking anyone to tear anything down. I'm not asking anyone to spend millions of dollars to build anything up either. So it does go over very well. So it goes I'm over, but is it happening? Not, it's so, so early in the stages that um, I'm hoping, yeah. It's it happening in Colorado at Rio Grande. They started yeah. pumping out water at the time it naturally would do, mm -hmm. and the fish stocks would come back in a big way. Yeah. Instead of just dumping it all off one time and getting the volume gone, yeah. And then letting it go 
be low. Natural relief. And they had to buffer yeah. that with you know, rafters and you know, other uses of the river. But they started doing it in some big rivers out west, and it worked really well. It, it, the fish come back in a big way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is the sturgeon endangered? Yes, they are. They're federally endangered. Pearl darter that changes behavior. Because uh, the crystal darter. The crystal, the crystal darter. Actually. The crystal darter. Sure. What was that? Uh, is there a genetic component to that, or is it just a behavioral plasticity? I don't really know. I was kind of a peripheral on that project. Um, they, they've, they've done. They have tissue that they're uh, that, uh, some uh, genetic uh, tissue they're going to look at, but I, I, I don't really know that part of that. It is very interesting though that why a fish would do that. Maybe um, it evolved in a system that actually. That had occurred naturally or something, and it had that uh, evolutionary memory um, alteration. Never mind. Is it going to be? I'm sorry. You're all right. Go ahead. Is it going to be reintroduced? Or um, there's no it? plans at this time. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Economic uh, data is there. What was that? Billion dollar, billion dollar fishing industry. Yeah. Um, hopefully that's low. It, it could be considerably more than that. Yeah. Uh, the catfish. Industry it used to be a five hundred million dollar mm -hmm. industry, and it, it you know certainly got into some, some problems, but may have been replaced with tilapia and, and mm -hmm. you know, some, some other products. Um, it, it, it'd be good if we had had some strong numbers. Um, yeah. I look on. I, I get. I'm not an anthropologist or a yeah. statistician. I get on the internet and look, and I try to get the, the best source I can. And it's better to be. It's probably two or three billion. I don't really know. I don't, know what, I, I I don't want to make an overstatement and have some. Florida claim. Jim, what is Florida claim? Just the recreational fishing industry. Mm -hmm. Several. Yeah. Several yeah. 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 It's, like all it's an important part of our state. That's well, sure. when you start putting some of these conservation projects into context, sometimes people ignore you know, the recreational benefits. Yeah, I try to make it clear that. How did we end up with yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, Actually, they were just chance. No. It's a long story. In the 70s, it yeah. used to be a, um, a logging company in Pasadena. Mm -hmm. And they were logging cypress, which was very expensive to do because it was in water. And they decided they were going to sell it. And, and um, there was some hybrid between nature conservancy and state policy. The whole book written on this. We got lots of confusion. <laughs> So, but they actually, the state, the politicians got together and bought this property, which is all these uh, preserves around the past war, for perpetuity. And the, the nature conservancy was heavily involved in that and, and a bunch of other local NGOs. But they bought it from the, the, the logging company. And that's why it's preserved today. In, in the very large tracts of this preserve. Now, north of that, they could do something. And what there has been some talk about building water parks on things like Bluff Creek around Bankley, but that hasn't really come to fruition, luckily. Um, and, but it's the, the key is, it's the only river of 200 CFS, it's a song large river, river. Flow, uh, in, in the lower 48 states. Everything else in the U.S. has been banned or silver. So, so is there a present designation or any, any status that would maintain that that's considered or well, a lot of the land associated with the river is state or federally owned. Uh, it's and always under attack, though. I mean, when I you say it, it's, it's always change. under attack. People are always trying yeah, to always proposing to projects for impoundments. Or the con it's constantly attacked, trying to develop it. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.